phones. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing some magic in the background uh, for our Facebook. Um, it's I guess that's I guess that's working okay so um, all right welcome everyone to uh, welcome everyone my name is uh, James Fisher I'm the research director at uh, White Memorial Conservation Center located in Litchfield Connecticut um, uh, thank you for joining us today for a presentation on the restoration efforts of the American chestnut tree in uh, Connecticut and historic range I'm a refuge biologist here at White Memorial, and my job is multifaceted. Uh, it's my privilege to get a chance to appreciate the 4,000 acre foundation um, in a unique way. Uh, like many of you, I walk the property and I notice the wildlife and the habitats that are around. And I also take notice of the evidence that the things um, that inhabit the property, for example, I'll often see tracks uh, walking, walking along and I gives me a chance to see what kind of mammals may have been there recently. But I also observe other evidence, and that includes the American chestnut uh, saplings that are on the property. And these trees have a unique story uh, to tell us and that we need to learn. Uh, unfortunately, that story keeps continuing with other new species of trees. Um, but like most stories, there's good news and bad news. And, um, and by no means are we at the end of that story. We are simply in the middle of it. And so that brings us brings me to uh, our guest speaker, Kendra Collins, uh, from the American Chestnut Foundation. Kendra joined the American Chestnut Foundation in uh, 2008 as the regional science coordinator for the New England region. She coordinates the scientific endeavors of the state chapters of the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, she receives a, she received a bachelor of science degree in environmental conservation science from the University of New Hampshire, and a master of Science in Natural Resources, uh, the forestry uh, program from the University of Vermont. Her master's research focused on the American chestnut uh, restoration, uh, which led her to become involved with the American Chestnut Foundation and the formation of the Vermont and New Hampshire chapters. Uh, Kendra worked previously with the citizen science programs through uh, New Hampshire's Volunteer Lake Assessment Program, a very influential program, I might add. Um, so with that, uh, Kendra, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure you can, I'm going to be able to, yeah, you should be able to uh, share your screen. So with that, Kendra, it's all yours. All right. Let me see if I can get this up here. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Are we in slideshow mode? Are we good? We're good, Kendra. We can see your screen. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really um, happy to be here this morning or this afternoon. Um, I was going to be tag teaming this presentation with um, a member, an active member of our Connecticut chapter, but um, things did not align <laughs> for anyone to join me today. So um, you only get to listen to me. I apologize. Um, what I'm hoping to do um, over the next 45 minutes or so is go through kind of the story of the American chestnut, uh, what our organization is doing to try and restore the species and kind of weave in some of what is happening um, in Connecticut, uh, locally with our Connecticut chapter. Um, as Jamie kind of alluded to, um, we have our structure at the American Chestnut Foundation. We have a national staff, um, which I serve on 
I'm the only staff person in New England. Our main office is in Asheville, North Carolina. We have a research farm in Meadowview, Virginia, uh, where a lot of our mainline science program, um, sort of the on the ground stuff is happening. Um, and then we have our state chapters, which also participate very closely in our science program and really extend our reach. It's a really great network of citizen scientists and that's primarily who I work with in New England. Um, so with that, um, I guess we'll, we'll get started. So the mission of the American Chestnut Foundation is to return the iconic American chestnut to its native range, um, which is a fairly large goal. So let's, let's look at what that goal really looks like. <laughs> uh, the American chestnut was a prominent hardwood species for, um, throughout its, its range, which spread from you know, Maine down to Georgia, kind of following the spine of the Appalachian Mountains. So this is an area of about 200 million acres estimated about 4 billion American chestnut stems within that area. So in areas of chestnut predominance, you could have one in four hardwood stems be an American chestnut. So it's a pretty common hardwood species. Um, and, you know, and a pretty generalist in terms of range, and it's a pretty broad range for hardwood. The American chestnut's a large um, dominant or co-dominant species in the forest. So average size in New England would probably have been 80 to 100 feet tall, three to five feet in diameter, um, but certainly there are much larger trees on record. The largest diameter um, recorded was a, a tree in a cove forest in North Carolina that was like 17 feet diameter. So that's a massive, <laughs> that's a massive tree. Um, and long lived, you know, they could live to be 100, or, you know, to be 100 years old. Um, this picture down here on the uh, on the left was actually taken. This is a, a chestnut in Connecticut, um, and I really like that this picture shows the the timber form of American chestnut. I don't know if you guys can see my my little mouse here, but um, these trees could really just grow tall, straight, and limbless for like 50 feet, um, which um, was partially to do with their adaptation. They can kind of lie in wait in the forest, and once they get an opening, they just shoot straight up into the canopy. That great timber form was important in particular because it's also a good timber species. You know, the wood was um, fairly or highly rot resistant due to a large um, proportion of tannin. Uh, it's light, easy to work. And so as a timber species, chestnut was used a lot as the backbone of things. Um, the split rail fencing along the Blue Ridge Parkway is almost all American chestnut. There are log cabins still just sitting, you know, right on the ground. Um, and not rotted and are made of chestnut. In Connecticut, a lot of your tobacco barns are made of, of chestnut. This picture here was actually sent to me by someone who was restoring a, chest, um, a chestnut barn in Connecticut. So I thought you guys would get a kick out of that one. Um, in addition, the tannin could be extracted from the bark to support a leather tanning industry that existed in the southeastern U.S. Um, and those um, the mills that produced the or that worked on that tannin extraction also would pulp um, the, the wood for paper production. So you really get a lot of products out of this tree. In addition, it's a nut producer. We've all heard Nat King Cole crooning about chestnuts roasting on the open fire. Um, that's because that was a thing. <laughs> um, and so certainly harvesting chestnuts for human consumption was a cash crop for, um, for some farmers. Uh, and it's also a great species for wildlife. It's a, a large, nutritious nut um, and a fairly reliable producer. Unfortunately, a lot of those great uses, all those great uses really were lost with the um, accidental importation of chestnut blight. So in the late 1800s, we were importing Japanese chestnut into the US as a sort of ornamental or nut producer, probably more as an ornamental, honestly, the Japanese chestnut doesn't taste as good, but, um, but it's a pretty tree. And uh, by 1904, we had identified chestnut blight as a new pathogen. It was identified in the Bronx Zoo in New York City, um, and it spread very quickly. So by the 19-teens to 20s, probably, it had spread through most of Connecticut, and it was into northern New England by the 1930s, um, and down all the way to the end of the range um, in the south by the 1950s. So um, our trees did not have any resistance to this pathogen. Um, What did that look like? Uh, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> um, you know, when you had a population of four billion trees with zero resistance, there weren't a lot of survivors. Uh, these pictures are taken 
in, from Shenandoah National Park. And I think this one, there's a couple versions of this and in one of them you can actually see a little car. Um, maybe it's off to the side here, maybe it got cut off. Um, but those were some pretty big trees that had died. Um, and so this was really devastating. It's considered one of the, um, I think the largest ecological disaster that the U.S. has ever faced. Um, and certainly we have quarantine rules for plant importations now because of this tragedy. Um, obviously we know those don't, aren't perfect. We have a lot of other pests and pathogens in the U.S. that have um, popped from the ocean to, uh, to grace us with their presence. I know you guys are dealing a lot with ash borer um, down in Connecticut now, and um, we have it in Vermont. Uh, where I am, so that'll be interesting to watch, and interesting and sad. <laughs> um, to introduce you to um, our our pathogen, uh, blight is a is a fungus, Cryptobacteria parasitica, and it attacks the cambium or the living tissue under the bark. So it either gets in through natural cracks in the bark that occur as the trees mature. We often see cankers form in like branch crotches or um, you know, or just other natural cracks, um, or in wounds. So it just, it needs a way to get under the bark into that living cambium tissue. Uh, the fungus spreads uh, through spores. It has two different kinds of spores. One is an airborne spore that can just blow for miles in the wind. The other is sort of a spiral sticky spore that um, can be stuck to wildlife and can spread that way. So, um, you know, early on there were some uh, cultural methods to try and prevent the spread of light. Uh, people tried cutting swaths of forest between healthy stands of chestnut and disease stands, hoping that you know they could create some separation and, and sort of keep the blight from going anywhere. And often the blight had jumped that gap by the time they finished doing the clearing. Um, early fungicides were tried too, but um, you know when you're talking about a forest of four billion trees across 200 million acres, you're not going to get out there and spray everything with fungicide. So, um, yeah, there's not a lot you can do for blight, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, that said, blight does not uh, um, typically completely kill the tree. It kills the living stem. So it's a, you know, it causes these girdling cankers. It gets in under the cambium. So if you imagine your tree trunk like a straw, if you get a hole in the straw, it's annoying. You can't get the water all the way through it. But once that straw is severed, it stops working. What chestnut does in response to that is it sprouts from the base, um, like a lot of species do. And chestnut's a really great root sprouter. Um, so we still have a lot of chestnut on the landscape. So this is a map of the forest inventory analysis for chestnut from 2010. And um, they estimated about 435 million chestnut stems with their inventory. Um, but I think 85% of those were an inch in diameter or less. Um, and I would hazard a guess that most of those that were larger than an inch were probably still under six inches. Um, the blight is still out there. It grows or it lives on all of these re-sprouting chestnut stems as well as a few other species. So it's not going anywhere. And ultimately what this means is we have a species that we consider functionally extinct. So they're still out there on the landscape and because the num, you know, the stems are still there, a lot of um, states and federal designations do not consider the chestnut to be threatened or endangered. There are a few states that consider it a special a species of special concern, I think Maine at least for New England. Um, but generally, you know, it's still out there. It's just not doing much. It's, it's living as an understory shrub. Uh, it, you know, maybe lives for five to 15 years before blight finds it again and they can keel over. Um, and it's not sexually reproducing, so it doesn't really have an opportunity to evolve on its own. Um, and develop any resistance because there's no, there's no mating happening. So, um, so that said, we are always interested in finding chestnuts <laughs> and um, identifying those trees that are in the landscape, especially the larger specimens. And what um, the two best times of year to find those are in the summer when they're flowering, usually late June or early July. There's not much else flowering at that time, so they can be pretty um, and kind of jump out at you. And this time of year when they're fruiting. And I actually was out, we're harvesting about a week early this year. So I was out most of this past week harvesting at different sites across the state. Um, and I know I had volunteers uh, throughout the region that were scrambling <laughs> to beat the squirrels to the nuts. Um, but you know, the, the flowers that you see in June or July are the male flowers. They're these long uh, white fluffy catkins. 
And then the female flowers develop into this baby spiky burr that typically has three nuts in it. Um, and so both of those are usually the signs people see to you know, have the tree jump out at them is like, oh, that's something different. That's an American chestnut. And that's when I get the most uh, leaf samples sent in from folks that have done. There are other species of chestnut that have been imported. Obviously, we talked about Japanese chestnut being um, the likely culprit for bringing chestnut blight into the US. Um, but there is also a Chinese species, which is probably the most commonly planted um, and most common to find aside of, from the American chestnut. There's also a European chestnut, which I do find more of in Connecticut and around New York. Um, I think a lot of Italian families brought those, that species with them because um, it was culturally important. Um, and then the Japanese chestnut is, um, is, has also been planted. There's actually a gorgeous Japanese chestnut specimen in, uh, in Old Lyme, Connecticut, um, in front of the bean thistle, if you guys are familiar with that area um, over on the coast. Um, it's a really fluffy tree. <laughs> it's like, you know, a couple hundred years old. Um, the, but the, you know, the leaves and the nuts are all slightly different um, across the species. And then um, this little guy didn't get mentioned as a chestnut species. This is um, Allegheny chinkapin which is a native, um, it's more of a shrub species. It produces one nut per burr that's much smaller. Um, we don't tend to see chinkapin up into New England, um, but they do exist farther south, um, certainly in Pennsylvania and, and south of there. Uh, I'm gonna spend a, just a minute going over some features of the American chestnut and Chinese chestnut in case you do come across these guys, because uh, these are the two most common that you'll find. Um, Connecticut, we'll talk a little bit more about breeding in Connecticut, but there's a long history of chestnut breeding in your state. So finding funky hybrids is not um, as uncommon in Connecticut as it is at other places. Um, but the American and Chinese species, I think, are still probably the two most common that, um, that I see. So the American chestnut has this long kind of canoe-shaped leaf, this kind of breaking ocean wave. Um, dentation and the leaf surface tends to be dull or at least not particularly shiny or leathery and the underside of the leaf is hairless. Um, it'll have some long hairs on the midrib but that's really about it for hairs. The twigs are kind of a reddish brown. I apologize this picture is really grainy um, and they have these really small lenticels. The buds are usually red or orange and stick out at about a 45 degree angle also hairless. Um, and then the underside of chestnut leaves are um, actually really helpful for ID. They have uh, different types of trichomes or these little glandular hairs. And so on American chestnut, they have these little round kind of donut shaped glandular hairs that are made up of four cells. And so those are really useful for identification because none of the other chestnut species have this particular kind of glandular hair. Chinese chestnut, on the other hand, has a very glossy, shiny leaf um, and the underside is absolutely covered in hair so you can see this kind of looks white and that's because if you looked at that under a microscope there are thousands um, of stellate hairs all over the surface of this leaf um, and it'll feel kind of soft too. Um, the dentation is a little bit more wedge shaped or I often see it almost as bristles um, on sun leaves. The leaf base is a little bit more blunt the twig is this kind of pea green or tan color, and then the twig is actually hairy, the buds are fuzzy, and the buds are more round and oppressed, like right up next to the stem instead of that at a 45 degree angle. Um, looks like I'm missing my trichome picture here of what the trichomes on Chinese chestnut look like, but they have this very distinctive little kind of flopped over lollipop um, glandular hair that only I only really see on the midrib. Um, and so that's very different from what we see on an American chestnut and also pretty helpful. Uh, with either of the species, all of these really definitive traits form more clearly on leaves that are grown in full sun as opposed to the shade. Um, you don't tend to get this really shiny, glossy luster on shade Chinese leaves. There don't tend to be as many hairs, sometimes none, on shade leaves. So when we're looking for a sample, we really want something that's um, from a sunny exposure of the tree. Um, so if we've got Chinese or Japanese chestnut that can survive blight, um, why is our mission to bring back the American chestnut? Uh, 
the American chestnut was our native species. It's adapted to grow in our forest. I'll show you a little bit more about um, Chinese chestnut and Japanese chestnuts adaptations in a sec here. Um, but because blight isn't going anywhere and our native trees don't have any resistance, um, really what we're looking for is a resistant American chestnut that we can get back into the forest. So American chestnut versus Chinese or Japanese chestnut, just to compare the two. So American chestnut, not resistant to blight. Chinese and Japanese chestnut, those are resistant to blight. They evolve in Asia alongside the, the pathogen or the, the fungus. And so they, they can get chestnut blight, but it's kind of like getting a cold. They sort of shrug it off. Um, American chestnut, again, tall timber form tree, 80 to 100 feet tall. And um, Chinese and Japanese chestnut tend to be more of a spreading form. Uh, and again, chestnut is a dominant canopy tree with a straight trunk, few lower branches. Uh, the Asian chestnuts tend to be more orchard form. So we want something that has this dominant form, that has this height, but has resistance to blight. I see someone raising their hand. Jamie, I don't know how you wanted to handle questions in the middle versus questions at the end. Um, why don't we handle the questions at the end? Um, okay. we'll, we'll deal with those in the form of the chat box or the Q&A. And if, if someone has a difficulty with that, we can then do a, um, allow them to talk. But that way we okay. can the, the concentration. On that. Okay, cool. Well, I apologize to whoever was raising your hand. I'm not trying to ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're we'll not sure. <laughs> we definitely want people to. We definitely want people to ask questions, but we'll wait till till the end. Okay, great. Wasn't sure the ground rules there. Um, so anyway, so we have, you know, so we want to get back to this forest form American chestnut, but we want resistance. And so, how do we do that? Um, the science strategy for the American Chestnut Foundation is something our our um, our board came up with. It's kind of a cute acronym called Three Bur which is the three B's, breeding, biocontrol, and biotechnology united for restoration. So breeding is traditional breeding. Biocontrol is primarily um, technologies to reduce the pathogenicity of the fungus. And biotech is actually a pretty big bucket. Um, it in includes genomic selection, genomic mapping, genotyping, um, and genetic engineering. And so we'll talk about each of those and um, and I'll kind of show you, you know, where, where and how the Connecticut chapter is involved with some of those efforts too. So breeding. Breeding has a pretty long history with, um, with American chestnut. Um, when we, you know, the initial uh, cultural methods that were tried were, you know, became clear that those were not going to be the solution. Breeding was the next thing that people turned to. And so the USDA had a breeding program that ran for an awfully long time. It finally petered out in like the mid 60s, I think. And the Connecticut Ag Station in New Haven actually has the longest running chestnut breeding program in the country. Um, Sandy Anigasakis ran that for a long time. Um, she has retired, but is still volunteering. <laughs> it seems to happen with a lot of chestnut scientists. They just can't quite uh, walk away. Um, and so I'm not quite sure the, the actual status of the breeding program at the Ag Station at this point, but the collection of trees there is really impressive. And we've actually been visiting over there for some collections for a few different um, science projects the last um, last year or two and getting to know that collection a little better. So certainly a cool place to go see chestnuts if you want to see a whole range of um, different kinds of hybrids and species and levels of resistance. It's a lot of, a lot of neat stuff there. Um, but the, the general idea with breeding for America, um, with American chestnut is that the Chinese and Japanese species have resistance, the American doesn't, and so can we bring that resistance over into a tree that otherwise looks and acts like American chestnut. And um, our program, our breeding program began in the early 1980s, and that's, that's what we've been working on, for, uh, you know, since then. Um, we initially had a three gene model we were working with that assumed there were only three genes controlling blight resistance. With the advance of a lot of these genomic technologies, we know there's a lot more genes involved in blight resistance, which does make breeding harder. Um, but we also have better tools for selecting trees now. So we're continuing on with our breeding program. We still have to plant an awful lot of trees to find those that do have resistance. And so this is a picture of one of the seed orchards um, from one of our chapters. And these trees on the left are 
not yet selected, so they're on pretty tight spacing and there's quite a few of them. The trees on the right here have been selected, at least phenotypically, for blight resistance. Um, there's still additional selection work that we'll do on those trees to probably whittle it down a little bit further. Um, but for now, that's, you know, but that just kind of shows you the progression. Um, so selection, ultimately, we're looking for trees that have this really nice timber form, um, a nice American chestnut form. We honestly typically don't look at the form of the tree so much as some of leaf characteristics and other morphological traits that are um, proxy for the, the American species. Um, and then, of course, the blight resistance is particularly important. So, um, but we do end up finding these nice trees that have um, good resistance and really nice form. So that's ultimately what we're going for um, at every generation of breeding. So our, gen our breeding program takes at least six generations to get through, possibly more, um, depending on how much more we want to refine things. But um, so it's a long process. It's a lot of planting trees to cut a lot of them down. But we do, um, we do find some good ones in there. Um, our Connecticut chapter has been participating in our breeding program locally since, I want to say, 2004 or 2005. They have um, seven breeding orchards scattered throughout the state uh, and three seed orchards, which are kind of the next step past breeding orchards. This is actually a socially distanced planting group planting a new plot of seed orchard this past spring in Winchester. That's our newest uh, seed orchard in the state. Uh, to give you an idea of where they're scattered, I think the uh, little green arrows are the breeding orchards, uh, blue are the three seed orchards, and then the red are sort of like research and demonstration plantings, including the one at, at White Memorial. So that's kind of the, the breeding piece. Biocontrol, as I mentioned, is really talking about uh, or looking at ways to reduce the pathogenicity of the fungus. And so in the, I want to say in the 50s or so, chestnut blight made it to Europe. European chestnut is sort of in the middle for blight resistance. It's not as susceptible as American, but it still is not resistant either. And a few, you know, maybe 10, 20 years after blight made it to Europe, they started noticing that a lot of the trees had these large, um, kind of ugly, but healing cankers. The trees were healing from the blight. And uh, what was ultimately discovered is that there was a virus of the fungus's RNA that was reducing its, its virulence on the trees. And that was giving the trees just enough of an edge to be able to kind of heal over the infection or, or handle the canker and keep on growing. And so we've been trying to figure out since I think like the 80s or so, um, how to use this technology in the US or use this tool to keep chestnuts alive. Uh, the issue that we've had here is there's a lot of vegetative compatibility types of the fungus. In order for the fungus to pass this virus on to other little colonies of fungus, they need to mate. They need to sexually um, be compatible. And if they're not, then they can't transfer that virus. And so the most recent avenue of research has actually been looking at ways to reduce that barrier to mating. And a uh, research group at the University of Maryland has developed something they call the super donor strain of hypovirus. And so that has a few genes knocked out that were involved in those um, incompatibilities. And so this strain of hypovirus can actually spread without, um, without an issue to other, um, other strains of the fungus and pass that virus a lot more easily. Um, it still requires a fair amount of fiddling, um, you know, some human intervention. It's not something that just will probably spread on its own, or at least that doesn't seem that way yet, but we're still working, you know, there's a lot of work yet to be done. Because it's a modified um, form of the fungus, it is a permitted um, product, so it's not widely available yet, but we are hopeful that that's something that would be a tool for our orchard managers to keep their trees going. Um, rather than the typical tool, which is to let them die and re-sprout. Because <laughs> um, at least then we don't lose them, but it would be nice if we could keep them as big trees. Uh, so that was it on bio, bio control. For biotech, there's a kind of, as I mentioned, a couple different avenues. Um, the two biggest ones for our organization are the sequencing and genomics, and then we'll talk about the engineering in a second. Um, you know, we would love to be able to use marker-assisted selection for our breeding program. 
so we'd like to be able to genomically um, predict which trees have resistance or have the genes we're looking for um, or have enough of them so that we can make really good accurate selections. One of the um, difficulties of selecting trees um, phenotypically just based on what they look like is that the site a chestnut is growing on can really have an impact on how resistant it looks. If it's on a really good site, it can look really resistant. And if it's on a tough site, um, it's already stressed and the resistance doesn't look so good. Um, for example, I, we have a couple of orchards in Connecticut that we have selected trees from. And one, the trees have all looked really great. And when we genotyped them, they had a lot less Chinese genes in them than I would have expected for how good they looked. Uh, versus another site where the trees looked a little rough, um, but they had a lot more Chinese genes in them and presumably higher levels of resistance, but they're just on a site that's a little wet for chestnut um, and they've struggled a little bit more. So um, if we can actually see what's going on at the gene level and select trees um, based on some more concrete markers, that would be really helpful. Um, so that, that's a lot of the work that we're we're doing now is mapping various species and, and trying to figure out what those regions are that are coding for resistance and you know, if those models can be used across different populations and species. So um, it's really nice that those technologies are advancing quickly. A lot of the work would have been incredibly expensive a few years ago that we're doing now at a, a reasonable cost. So. Um, and then the other piece of biotechnology is genetic engineering. And you guys may be familiar with this project. Um, SUNY's Environmental Science and Forestry College in Syracuse, New York has been working on developing a transgenic American chestnut for a long time. And they've received a fair amount of press coverage, um, especially recently because they're actually going through a permitting um, exercise that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically what they've done is they've used agrobacterium mediated transformation uh, to insert a gene for um, that they, they, they hope or they thought, I think they thought probably correctly, would give the chestnut some resistance to blight. So agrobacterium is a natural sort of tumor causing, um, I believe it's a virus of, um, of trees, it makes these giant goofy looking galls. But it's a natural bioengineer, and so if you can get a gene of interest into that, it'll um, replicate it and also insert it into um, whatever you're trying to do. So they use that process to get this oxogene into chestnut embryos. The oxogene produces oxalic oxidase. The reason that this was selected is that the blight produces oxalic acid, and that's what is killing the wood tissue as it you know, kind of advances through the cambium and around the tree. So if we can oxidize that acid, then it can stop the blight in its tracks, in theory. Um, so this has been done and tested. Um, it seems to work pretty well. It's not the same mechanism Chinese chestnut uses. Um, Chinese chestnut has a pretty complex multigenic um, something or other going on. This is certainly a piece of what Chinese chestnut is doing. Um, and so far, you know, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, that said, it's a very, it's a highly permitted um, process um, and uh, approach. So, you know, for example, SUNY has to be really careful with any of the crosses they make those need to, that's a permitted activity. They have to use these um, wire mesh bags over their pollination bags to make sure nothing is escaping. Um, and so they're actually working. So this, this work is regulated by the USDA um, and release of it would be up to USDA, EPA, and also the FDA because it is a food product um, or could be. So they're actually working with USDA right now to see if they can get this tree deregulated and um, made more widely available for people to plant um, and work with. Um, you know, which from a research perspective would be really useful. Uh, you need, there's a lot of permitting and limitations to planting these trees currently. Uh, they, they can only be allowed to get to a certain size before you have to cut them down. Um, they can only be planted in certain places. They need to be fenced. Um, so if we can get these things out in the forest, um, it would be really nice to be able to see how this technology is going to hold up. Um, it's, it's pretty promising thus far. Um, that said, I'll put in one plug. There is a public comment period going on right now for that USDA application. And if you are interested, 
particularly if you're supportive, but even if you're not. <laughs> Everyone is, is welcome to participate in that. We have information um, about it on our website, which is um, acm.org. Um, you can find a lot of resources there about that, that petition. Um, but, you know, with this transgenic tree comes a potential, not even a potential, comes a bottleneck. If this tree works, you know, if this resistance holds up, it's a clonal tree and it doesn't have diversity which we all know is important to getting trees back on a population of trees back out on the landscape. And so one of the things that we're really um, asking our chapters to help with right now is finding more wild trees and getting them into collections that we call germ positive conservation orchards so that we can be prepared to help diversify this, um, this transgenic chestnut, assuming that it um, is deregulated and something we can work with. So there's a couple different ways you can report wild trees to us. Um, anything reported that we might use for a breeding program, we do need to sample from to verify the species. So you know, I occasionally get emails from folks that are like, "Oh, my, you know, my arborist said I have an American chestnut, and that's great, but I still want to see a sample um, uh, before we're going to use it for anything." Um, but reporting can be done through TreeSnap, which is an app, a smartphone app that was developed by one of our university partners. It's actually used to track a lot of different species of um, concern right now. So I think ash is in there, hemlock, um, probably elm, a few other things. Uh, but the questions and information that's um, reported on chestnut, if you use it, uh, does mimic a lot of the information on our traditional tree locator form. So you can use either, you know, if you're out in the woods and you come across a chestnut, you might not have this form handy, but if you have your phone handy, which most of us often do, um, you can pull up the TreeSnap app and get um, some information and grab a, a leaf sample to bring home. The one thing I do still like to get this form, you can, if you use the app, you can nix any of the information that is the same. I don't need it. You can put the TreeSnap um, ID up here so that I can find the data in TreeSnap. I have access to that. Um, but the property owner and submitter information, there's no personal information that comes to us through TreeSnap. So if it's a tree we might want to use, it's really helpful to know who owns it so that we can actually go to that person and ask permission um, to enter the property or utilize their tree. Um, and then a sample, this is a really nicely pressed sample. This is probably the best thing I can get for ID. Nice, nice bit of twig. It's got a lot of buds on it. The leaves are nice and flat and spread out. Um, I mentioned those trichomes that we used for ID. Um, those are on the underside of the leaf, and so I put them under a microscope. And if the leaf is nice and flat, that makes it really easy. If it's all crinkled or folded over, the leaf, you know, when I unfold it, it breaks. Um, or I have to, up, you know, raise and lower the, micro the microscope stage to be able to see what's going on, and I get seasick. So samples like this make me very happy. <laughs> um, oops, wrong way. Um, if you, were, you know, so if you use TreeSnap, you can see other chestnuts that have been reported. And there's a lot that have been reported in Connecticut already through TreeSnap. I'm honestly not sure if these little question marks are other species or other users. Um, Jack Swatt, who is the president of the Connecticut chapter, pulled this map. Um, and he's reported a lot of trees through TreeSnap. So this might just be his, um, his little snaps. But um, but they are around and you know almost all of chestnut is or all of Connecticut is good chestnut habitat um, so we find a lot of chestnuts in your state. When we find these trees if they're flowering we want to try to get nuts off of them for conservation purposes so if there are two trees flowering together they will um, open pollinate and produce nuts but if they do not have a pollination partner chestnut is self infertile and will not produce viable seeds and so one of the things that Connecticut chapter does in the summertime is actually uh, they work on controlled pollination of some of these wild trees. So they'll collect pollen from a flowering wild tree and you know, dry it and bring it to another flowering tree to pollinate it. Uh, they've developed some really great partnerships with um, utilities uh, so that they can get up into these trees with bucket trucks. So Eversource and UI in particular have been really helpful. Um, I think Bartlett has helped in the past as well. And, um, and this is a really fun part of the work that we get to do out, out in the field is actually controlled pollinating wild trees. It's always, always a good time. 
the nuts from those trees go into these germplasm conservation orchards, which is another place that Connecticut chapter has been focusing lately. I think they established four of these kinds of orchards this past um, spring. And these are primarily to preserve genetic diversity of the American chestnut, um, you know, in the in light of the transgenic chestnut, um, you know, hopefully coming online, these orchards would be a place where we could um, pollinate trees with pollen from, from that program to help diversify uh, what they have. Um, and typically, a germplasm conservation orchard is going to be composed of 10 unique wild sources and 10 trees per source, so about 100 trees. Um, if you have space for 80 trees, we'll do eight sources. If you have space for, you know, 150 trees, we'll do 15 sources. This is a very scalable orchard type, um, and so this is just sort of a, you know, kind of a baseline to start with. Uh, these orchards are typically planted from seed that we get off of these wild trees. Um, but they could also be planted with um, grafted seedlings. We're working on our grafting game right now. Um, grafting chestnut is much more of an art form than it is for some of the, say, the fruit trees. So there are not very many people in our organization who are good at it, but we're trying to uh, increase that number uh, so that we can get some more grafted material. Because unfortunately, a lot of chestnuts, chestnut needs sun to flower. And a lot of the wild trees we find are suppressed seedlings in the understory and they're not going to flower. So if we can find a way to get them grafted and then, you know, and then start flowering, uh, that would be, that's really helpful. So why would you plant Native American chestnuts? Because, you know, we have already discussed that they are susceptible to blight and they will get blight. <laughs> um, but preserving native germplasm is important. Um, you know, some of these sources that we find are way out in the woods, they're not particularly accessible, or, you know, the trees do run out of steam resprouting eventually. So if we can, you know, collect this germplasm in places we can manage, um, it's, it's helpful. And also, because these trees are going to resprout and kind of create a little bit of a shrubby habitat over time, it does create some early successional habitat for some species um, that, that like that. Um, they will produce nuts. Um, you know, typically, even if you know a lot of the trees are dying back and, and re-sprouting, you know, you're going to have um, nut production most most years. Um, and it's good practice. You know, you learn how to grow trees, learn how or learn how to grow chestnut trees, learn if they like your site. Um, you know, you get some nuts out of it. You can get um, wood for some projects. Uh, it's an opportunity to educate people um, and also just see what the fungus does, uh, or even play with some. Um, you know, treatment methods. There is a, a tool um, some of our orchard our growers use called mud packing, where you can um, pack mud into an individual tanker to kill it and keep your trees going. So, um, you know, if you just like playing with trees and you like chestnuts, it's a, it's a good project. Uh, if anyone is interested in hosting an orchard, um, the Connecticut chapter has worked with private individuals, land owning or organizations, um, NGOs, um, you know, state. Uh, I don't know if they've done anything on state land, but definitely town land um, or city city properties. Uh, typically, we're looking for a minimum of an acre, and it needs to be a site that's good for growing chestnut. Um, so good chestnut sites are well-drained, slightly acidic soil, full sun so that they'll actually flower. Uh, in Connecticut, you guys have an awful lot of deer, so protection from deer is pretty important. Um, and also accessibility, you know, for maintenance, you want to be able to get in there to mow or whatever it is that you need to be doing. So. Um, for a germplasm conservation orchard, which we talked about most recently, you know, that's typically 100 trees on wider spacing, um, but those are really scalable. A seed orchard is a little bit less flexible. Um, we typically plant about 3,000 stems um, in a seed orchard uh, in about an acre, not all at the same time, um, and then whittle that down to, you know, maybe 50 to 100 trees that have um, decent resistance. So we plant an awful lot. That's part of our breeding program. So the seed orchard is a little bit more involved. Um, we typically look for an organization to host those just because of the, the longevity of that project. So if you're interested in getting involved, there's a few ways you can do that. Certainly become a member of TACF. Um, we'd love to have you. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We rely on membership and um, donations and um, citizen scientists to get involved. Uh, one of our member benefits is a really nice chestnut magazine, so that's kind of a nice perk that comes out of the time of year. Um, certainly, if you like giving talks, if you like doing outreach, we always need more people to give chestnut presentations because it's not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> um, but we do have materials and resources available if, um, if that's something you're ever interested in. Um, or certainly, if you have a group that you think would like a chestnut talk, um, Jack 
Um, SWAT, who's the Connecticut chapter president, is typically very willing to give chestnut presentations to anyone who would like one. So there's a, a local resource for that as well. Um, certainly, you can plant some Americans or plant some hybrids on your property um, to you know get get involved with, with growing and learn how that works. We make our most advanced hybrids from our breeding program available through a, a C-level membership. It's not very many trees, but you do get um, a few that you can play with and they're not, you know, they're not a final product from our breeding program, but they are gonna have more resistance than a, a pure American. Um, you can certainly volunteer at one of our orchards. Those are scattered around and often um, can use more cans to get work done and certainly you can get out and find trees. If you like hiking, uh, walking around in the woods, it's a great time of year to look for chestnuts. Uh, they're a close cousin to beech and oak, so the leaves don't tend to fall off. Rather, they just sort of get brown and, and hang on, uh, kind of like, like beech and oak. Um, and those burrs would be out around now for anything flowering, so um, we always are interested in your reports. So I think that's about it for the formal presentation. If you have questions, um, certainly I'm gonna stick around until Jamie tells me I need to leave um, <laughs> and answer any questions you guys may have. Uh, but there's my contact info. And again, Jack Spot is the chapter president. Um, he's very responsive over email and I'm sure would be happy, especially if anyone's interested in getting involved. He'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Kendra. Um, so I guess what we'll do is we'll open it up to questions. Uh, you can either uh, type in questions in the question and answer section or in the chat window. Um, Jerry Griswold is also still on the line, I believe, and she'll try to keep an eye on our Facebook Live for any questions. I have a question for you, uh, Kendra, and that is um, with regards to the form that you have for, for, for folks to fill out or, or TreeSnap, uh, obviously TreeSnap is something they can install on their smartphones, um, but where can, they can just email you for the, uh, to get a copy of that form that they could- Yeah, and actually it's on our website. Why don't I put that Great. in the chat for you guys? Great, um, that's fantastic. ACF.org and then I think we have like a tree ID resources page, which actually has a, a bunch of nice resources for how to, you know, if you, you know, how to try to figure it out on your own, but we're always happy to look at samples, and especially if you think it's an American, we'd love to see it. Yeah, and these are for trees that are uh, flowering and fruiting only, or or would you be willing to accept anything that's even a stump, a stump sprout? Oh, anything. Wow. Because we may want, you know, if we're looking for material to graft, yeah. you know, I mean, if you have, if you, if you stumble across an area, like, say, if you're familiar with, uh, the road up over Mount Riga into Mount Washington. Yeah. Salisbury. There are like thousands of chestnuts up there. Oh, I don't right. need you to like send in every single one, but on the yeah. locator form, you can say like, you know, this is an area of X number of acres with X number of stems on it. And that just gets the location on our radar. So we know that's an area with a lot of chestnut and then just take a representative sample and send it in. I'm not, I don't need to look at a thousand of them. But. Fantastic. So for our volunteers uh, and folks on the line, uh, the region on White Memorial property uh, south of Cranberry Pond, we call it the cathedrals. Uh, someone needs to send in some data on that. Card. Um, there are some areas uh, on the Solnit parcel near Camp Columbia that also has uh, an, uh, an area. So both of those are in the town of Morris. Um, I, right now, I can't recall, immediately recall a site in the town of Litchfield, but um, I think we need some folks out on the property looking for them. So, uh, Kendra, uh, get get ready. Okay, I will. I will stuff. apologize in advance if I'm a little slow to get back to you. Um, I work out of a university building, and um, it's only open for lab work still, so they were holding our mail, and I got a mail drop at the beginning of September that dated back to the beginning of June that has an awful lot of samples in it. So I'm getting through them. It seems like we're getting more regular installments of mail, but um, okay, it's great. kind of a weird year for everything, including mail. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully we'll keep those dried and pressed um, so that yes. they don't mold on you. Yeah, well, and definitely put them in um, paper and not like the bubble wrap. Um, yeah. Don't use any, any plastic because they, they do get moldy, but as long as they're in like, you know, between a couple pieces of cardboard and in, uh, you know, normal manila envelope or something. They should be sure. All right. That's great. I, I have a Facebook question. Hi, Kendra. Hey, um, a Facebook question from Margaret and she says, which is the large green horse chestnut? Not related. 
Um, so horse chestnuts and ornamental brought over from Europe is native to, um, to Europe. It's a close cousin to Buckeye, which is native to sort of the Midwest. Um, and it's, it's, I believe it's probably called horse chestnut. Botanically, horse can be coarse or larger. And the fur for a horse chestnut kind of looks like an American chestnut, but it has a lot less spines. They're a lot more spread out. And there's typically only one nut in that big burr instead of three. Um, they're more irregular shaped. They're really shiny and kind of a little bit lumpy, um, more like those Buckeye candies, which makes sense. Um, and uh, they're not edible. So definitely if you have a horse chestnut, don't eat them. They're, they're poisonous. They, they taste really bitter. So I don't think you get through too many and think it was a good idea to eat them, but um, don't eat them. Um, but they are commonly confused, and we do have a fact sheet on our website about it. I can put that in the chat as well if you want to read some more of the finer points. Um, horse chestnut is prone to something called leaf anthracnose, which is a leaf spot disease, and often I get folks who are very worried that their chestnut tree has this chestnut blight when it is in fact their um, horse chestnut has an anthracnose. So, Thank you. Good question. That was our that was our Facebook question so far, anyway. Okay, uh, Kendra. So far, we haven't had any um, any questions in our chat room or, or question and answers section. But I did have another question for myself. How long do you think it'll be before we start to see American chestnuts sort of commercially available for, say, the horticultural or ornamental, so that they're more widely distributed on the landscape. I, I mean, in, I'm not thinking in terms of the natural populations just yet. I'm just thinking that that might be sort of a, an initial step for getting more of them out on the landscape. How long might that be? Well, I think, you know, for the transgenic products, the transgenic tree, um, that's definitely kind of a next step. Hope is that, you know, they kind of would have two tracks because getting that tree diversified to a restoration population is going to take a few years of breeding. We're hoping that we can use some, you know, uh, highlight growth chambers to get pollen production happening much faster, and you know, do what we can to speed it along. But it's still going to take a while. Um, so the the hope is that they would be able to make some of those trees available for more horticultural, you know, backyard. You know, if someone wants one or two trees, I'm not quite quite sure what the distribution. Um, mechanism might look like. Like, I don't know when you'd be able to like go to Agway and buy one, um, but hopefully that's something that we could be making available. If, the, if you know, if this deregulation process goes through, you know, maybe in like five to 10 years. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, you know, and from the breeding program, you know, we have material available already um, through our seed membership program, but we don't have anything we're ready to hang our hat on yet for breeding. And I think breeding is gonna take us a little bit longer to get to the point where we have something that's really solid um, but but once we do you'll hear about it <laughs> yeah 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 i'm sure we will but it's it'll be really exciting to have again it's it's a it's a good shade tree from the standpoint of shading a person's home and and, and there's also these other benefits associated with it too with the, yeah. in terms of producing nuts and um yeah, we're very excited to get to like the Johnny Chestnut Seed stage yeah. of our program um, because everyone likes planting trees. It's not typically hard for us to get groups to come out and plant trees when we want to do that activity. But, you know, with orchard work, there's a lot of weeding and yeah. <laughs> maintenance. Yeah. It's a little more agricultural and, you know, the, the enthusiasm for some of the, the long-term care is not always as, uh, as easy to, to drum up. So just just so that folks can um, take a, uh, if they want to see a, an orchard, a nearby orchard in the Litchfield area, Litchfield Morris vicinity, uh, there's one at Wigwam Brook, in, mm -hmm. which is a Litchfield Hills Audubon Society site, right off of uh, 254 uh, in going towards uh, to, uh, Thomaston, between yep. Litchfield and Thomaston. Um, there's technically two orchards there, but do you, there's, yeah, there's, there's like a little demo planting right by the road, and then the yeah. orchard itself is up on the hill, and it's an old Christmas tree planting. We actually were in there, so last year we inoculated those trees with blight to start selecting them for mm -hmm. uh, resistance for kind of the next next step of breeding. And this summer I was able to get down there and um, we marked probably half, if not more, for cutting to get the first um, batch of less resistant trees out of there. So they've got an awful lot of work going on right now to clear that site out a little bit. Um, but there's some really nice trees in there and they're big. 
That's great. That's great. Nancy Siebeck is asking a question. Uh, if she finds a tree uh, that she wants to report, should she send uh, the information and the sample to, to your lab in Vermont? That's where you're, that's where you're at right now, right? Yes. Send it, to yes. your send, lab it in send it here. Okay. So, Fantastic. That would be the best. That would be the most expeditious. And then I would let um, you and, um, and Nancy, I think we've, we've met a few times. Hi. <laughs> um, it's been a while. Um, and I would let Jack um, and the, the folks in the Connecticut chapter who do a lot of the follow up on these wild tree reports know. I usually copy them when I send out the, the ID to whoever sends it in. So that's so you're so you're coordinating with the state chapter folks to corroborate the observation. Uh, that's yep. great. Well, and also just to give folks a local contact because you know a lot of folks you know they send in a sample and they would really love a touch point like you know will someone yeah. come out and pet my tree and <laughs> tell me it's nice <laughs> and I I can't do that for the whole region. Um, <laughs> sure. But, you know, especially if it's something, if it's American and flowering, then that's something, you know, we really might be able to use in our program. And so that's usually the trees that we, we have time to go visit or prioritize visiting. Yeah, oh, that's great. All right. Kendra, I'm, I have a question, um, and I'm, you might have touched on this, but I've been monitoring so many things. Uh, is there one state in particular that has a bigger population of healthy American chestnuts now? Does one state top another, or is it everybody's equally in the sinking ship. <laughs> well, we tend to find large es light escapees at the edges of the range. So in places that have less chestnut and therefore less blight pressure, um, okay. we, we can find some trees. Actually, I'm gonna pull a cookie down off the top of my fridge and show you guys. But oh, goody. Um, so up here in Vermont, we have you know a few trees that we found that are probably 75, 80 years old. Um, that you know, blight finds them eventually, mm. um, but yeah, northern New England we tend to find some bigger trees, and, and just the fringes of the range in general. You may remember, yeah. maybe ten years ago there was a story about a, a little collection of trees in Georgia, like the southern terminus of the AT, that someone yeah. found. Um, but yeah, it's just these places. If there's less blight, then the trees have a better shot of, of making it. So. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I have a friend that has a, a second home up in Wilmot, New Hampshire, and he he was saying, oh, I see them all the time. I see them all the time, but wow. I'm thinking, you see, really? And he's a smart guy. Oh, my God, look at that thing. Yeah, so this is, back it up. This was taken, this is a cookie from about eight feet up on the bowl of a chestnut that was harvested from a site in Vermont. It did die of light, but it was probably about 75 years old. So, and actually, I don't know if you guys can see this close up, but some of the growth rings on this are massive. Yeah, yeah that, I was just going to ask you the question about the growth rings, because um, does it, any idea when maybe the chestnut blight was, that that tree might have initially been exposed to the blight? Looking well, I don't think it was exposed until it started dying. <laughs> like, okay. nice. um, so, you know, I, it probably, let's see, I saw that tree for the first time in 06, maybe. Uh -huh. And then we saw blight, like it's really hard to actually find it on mature trees because the bark is so deeply furrowed. You have to look into the cracks and you just see these little bits of orange. Um, and so we knew there was some blight on it. How big the canker was, I don't know. So how long it had been there, it may have been a while. Um, but on a big tree, I think it can take, you know, five to 10 years to work its way all the way around because it has to girdle the whole stem. Yeah. So it goes a lot faster on small trees. Yeah, but still, that was a very, very uh, vigorous tree. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it succumbed. Um, so um, I haven't had any other questions raised from folks out there on uh, Zoom. Uh, Jerry, have you seen any more questions coming in from Facebook? No more. We have a nice little audience, however, but they're all extremely quiet today. Oh, that's great. Well, um, I'm glad everyone had a chance to join us. And uh, thank you, Kendra, for sharing uh, the story of the chestnuts and some of the future um, that we're hoping to see for the future for the for the tree and uh, some of the efforts. And I, I encourage everyone to please reach out to the state chapter um, uh, through either Jack Swat or through the American Chestnut um, 
uh, foundation to uh, to get more active, to become more active in the at the local level, because that's really where a lot of this work is going to be. It's really being done. Is at the is at your local neighborhood or your local uh, uh, chestnut stand. Um, so please get involved. Uh, again, thank you very much, Kendra, for joining us and for giving us that that, that great presentation. And uh, sure, it was great to join you guys. Thanks for having thank me, Kendra. Yeah, thank you. Right. We'll have a great right. rest of the weekend. Thanks, <laughs> you sure. too. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Don't forget to get involved with the American Chestnut Foundation, such a great organization. Please become a member of White Memorial if you can. We would love you more than we already do for joining us here today. Or you can always give a donation. It's so easy to do. We'll take that money from you. WhiteMemorialCC.org. You can just go under the What You Can Do uh, button. And don't forget, next week, Carrie Schvett, our Dynamic Education Director, has an abundance of children's programs available to you on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. And then next Saturday at 2 p.m., we are behaving birdly with Carrie Schved and Michael Audet. So again, uh, Kendra, thank you so much. Jamie, thank you so much for hosting. And we'll see you next time. Yes. Okay. We'll see you. Take care. Bye-bye.